Welcome back to the channel ladies and gentlemen, Boss the Hunter here and we are here for yet another Star Wars retrospective game review and one of the most requested games I've gotten, Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. No, not that Jedi Academy, this Jedi Academy, the action platform released in 2003 by Raven Software and Activision. The game follows the events of Jaden Kor, a Jedi student in Luke's new Jedi Academy during the New Republic era, and is often brought up in discussions of the best Star Wars games ever made. This is a fantastic game that has some of the best lightsaber combat of any Star Wars game. Before we go any further, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button for me. It costs you nothing, it's totally free, and we're trying to get to 501 subscribers, folks. When we get to 501 subscribers, I'm doing a special video, a retrospective of the Battlefront 2 campaigns, both of them together, specifically the first one, because it follows the 501st Clone Trooper Legion. So let's talk about some Jedi Academy and get into it and see if it's worth playing in 2023. Unlike every other game in the Jedi Knight series where he plays Kyle Katarn, Jedi Academy begins with a character creator. While it is a very basic system compared to modern gaming character creation, the game does allow us to choose from a variety of alien species, including Twi'leks, Rodians, Zabrak, and even Keldor, which recognizes the species of Jedi Master Plo Koon. It's over. Surrender. After choosing a species, the player can choose from a few preset clothing options split between upper body clothing and lower body clothing, as well as a few different face options. Players can also adjust the color of their clothing to a small degree. Once a character is created, the player is then allowed to build their own lightsaber, choosing from a decent variety of hilt options and blade colors. Blade colors range from traditional blue and green to yellow, purple, and even orange. I love the choice of lightsaber blade colors and it makes me reminiscent of Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight when I remember as a kid seeing yellow and purple lightsabers for the first time and being completely blown away. Once character creation is complete, we had a classic Star Wars intro complete with the text crawl. We learn that our adventure begins 10 years after the Battle of Endor as the Republic continues the battle of the forces of the Imperial Remnant, who are becoming increasingly desperate. While the Republic has been busy hunting down the scattered Imperials, Luke Skywalker, on his quest to restore the Jedi as peacekeepers of the galaxy, has established a new Jedi Academy on Yavin 4. We play as Jaden Kor, a promising Jedi student from Coruscant, who is en route to Yavin 4. Jaden's reputation precedes him, however, as he has achieved the impossible and already constructed his lightsaber with no formal Jedi training. I see you have constructed a new lightsaber. Your skills are complete. We then have a cutscene where we observe the small shuttle transporting the new Jedi students as it enters the atmosphere of Yavin 4. It is here that we are introduced to easily one of my least favorite Star Wars characters of all time, Rosh. Without giving too much away at the start, Rosh is an idiotic and annoying character with no real redeeming factors throughout the game. As the shuttle enters the atmosphere of Yavin 4, it is suddenly shot down by a mysterious figure on the surface of the planet wielding a strange staff. We watch as the shuttle crashes into the dense jungles of Yavin, while simultaneously we cut back to the Jedi Academy where a mysterious red-skinned Twi'lek has broken into the facility and appears to be accessing Luke's personal data pad. After speaking with Luke via comlink, Jaden and Rosh begin to make their way through the jungle to the Academy. The route to the Academy is a great introduction to the basics of lightsaber combat as Jaden uses his saber to battle shrieking reptilian creatures called Howlers and cut down trees in order to create bridges along the way. The combat system of Jedi Academy is identical to its predecessor, Jedi Outcast, and that's a great thing because in my opinion it's a very fun and innovative system. Essentially saber attacks are determined by which way Jaden is moving, combined with the time at which the attack button is pressed. Now that may sound strange, but when you combine it with a ton of great preset animations, you end up with fantastic looking lightsaber combat. This is made all the better by the saber's excellent hitbox detection and environmental effects, meaning that whatever the saber's blade touches, whether that's a wall, a tree, an enemy, even rain that falls from the sky and sizzles into steam on the lit saber's blade, there is always visual and audible feedback and effects. On the route back to the academy, Jaden and Rosh suddenly encounter two Imperial stormtroopers blocking their path. We then have our first battle against blaster-wielding foes, and learn that if Jaden is not attacking, he will automatically deflect blaster bolts, sometimes deflecting them back at the shooter. 
If Jaden is attacking or has his back to the blaster-wielding enemy, he can be shot and damaged. After defeating the troopers, a red lightsaber-wielding foe in a strange orange garb appears and attacks Jaden. So begins our first of many, many, many lightsaber duels that we will encounter throughout the game. Lightsaber duels are truly excellent in this game, just as in Jedi Outcast. However, just as in Outcast, if Jaden is overly aggressive and is hit in a certain place such as his head, he can be instantly killed. Just as with enemies armed with blasters, if Jaden is standing still, he will block incoming saber attacks, creating a combat system where timing is essential. Once we kill the lightsaber armed enemy, we see that when we win a lightsaber duel, we receive a kill cam mode where the camera rotates around Jaden as he defeats his enemy and the game goes into slow motion. After defeating the enemy, Jaden comes across an ancient Masasi temple in the jungles of Yavin 4. For context, the temples and structures we see on Yavin, such as the ones where the Rebel Alliance is based in A New Hope and Rogue One, are ancient structures built by a subspecies of Sith called the Masasi. The Masasi served as the warrior caste for the ancient Sith Empire thousands of years before the events of the Galactic Civil War, making these temples very strong in dark side aura. Jaden sees three subjects standing near the temple as a strange orange beam arcs from the trio into the side of the temple's outer wall. Upon closer inspection, Jaden can see two large humans in strange red and black attire. However, he is unable to see the third individual who is wielding a glowing scepter that is creating the orange beam. While attempting to creep closer, Jaden knocks some debris to the ground and before he can react is shot with the orange beam, knocking him to the ground unconscious. Jaden awakes to Kyle Katarn standing over him flanked by Rosh and three other Jedi students. As Kyle introduces himself and asks what has happened, two of the students approach, dragging the lightsaber-wielding foe Jaden defeated earlier. Luke then arrives on scene and Jaden tells him of the three mysterious subjects in the scepter. We get some great banner here between Luke and Kyle and see how they are very different Jedi Masters. Luke is clearly deeply insightful and stoic, which is a great contrast to Kyle's brashness and sarcasm. Hey Commander, looking good? Kenobi, you look worse for wear. How's temple life? Luke comments that he senses the dark side, to which Kyle responds that Luke always senses the dark side. The two masters then decide that Luke will escort the students back to the academy while Kyle investigates the Masasi temple. We then cut to an Imperial shuttle leaving Yavin's atmosphere and jumping into hyperspace. Inside the shuttle, an unseen female asks the red-skinned Twi'lek from earlier if she was able to recover Skywalker's records, to which she replies that she was as the Jedi were all busy in the jungle searching for their lost students. We then watch as the students are welcomed to the Academy by Luke, who tells them that traditionally Jedi Masters would take on and train one apprentice at a time. Always two there are. No more, no less. A master? And an apprentice. However, with so few masters available, each Jedi will be training multiple students in the ways of the Force. Both Jaden and Rosh are then assigned to Master Katarn, who immediately tells them to simply call him Kyle, stating that titles make his skin crawl. Kyle also tells Luke at this time that he found nothing at the Masasi Temple. However, it felt as if the temple's ancient dark side aura was now gone. At the conclusion of the introductions, Jaden and Rosh are led to the Academy's training grounds where our next level begins. Kyle tells Jaden and Rosh they'll be working their way through two separate obstacle courses in order to learn the use of their core force abilities. Kyle states that all Jedi possess the core force abilities and that as they grow in the force they'll be able to access new, more advanced abilities over time. Kyle also states that they will have access to both light and dark side powers as they progress and that no ability is inherently evil, it all depends on how the ability is used. Jaden then begins to make his way through the course, battling annoying, small, and difficult to hit remote droids, and learning to use various force abilities such as force jump and push. You see? You can do it. I call it luck. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. Midway through the course, we see Rosh on an overhead platform. Clearly trying to complete his course first, Rosh states that he will keep Jaden busy as he finishes and proceeds to use a terminal to release a lightsaber armed training droid. Jaden must battle and defeat the droid before continuing through the course. As we move through the remainder of the course, we learn further Jedi powers such as Force Pull, Speed, and Sense, the latter being used to see beyond normal vision and solve puzzles. Additionally, Force Sense can be used to see an enemy's life bar, which can be a useful tool against tougher opponents such as bosses throughout the game. As the course concludes, Raj asks if he won by finishing first, to which Kyle chastises him, revealing that he knew Raj activated the training droid to battle Jaden, and stating that if the droid had been set to Luke's training level, it would have killed Jaden. Rosh apologizes to Jaden, who is understandably angry, and while Kyle sympathizes with his anger, he also warns Jaden of its dangers and its ties to the dark side of the Force. Jaden then accepts Rosh's apology, and Kyle tells them both that it is time to put their training to the test and have them start completing Jedi missions throughout the galaxy. 
Luke then enters the training area, telling Kyle that he discovered a strange insignia on the garb of the lightsaber-wielding foe slain by Jaden in the jungle. After researching the insignia, Luke discovered that it was the symbol of an ancient Sith Lord, Marco Ragnos, who died almost 5,000 years ago. Luke tells Kyle, Jaden, and Rosh to be on the lookout for signs of anyone affiliated with Ragnos as they complete their missions around the galaxy. On completing this level, Jaden gets his first look at the mission recap, which not only tells Jaden how many enemies were killed, but breaks down by body part where his enemies were injured by lightsaber attacks. The recap scene also displays which force powers were used and the number of times they were used. We then cut to a transmission of Luke, who tells us that the Academy receives constant requests for Jedi aid around the galaxy, and that he believes in training through doing. Thus, students of all levels assist in these requests and complete missions. We then get to what really sets Jedi Academy apart from other Star Wars games and even Jedi Outcast, and that's the mission selection screen. During each segment of the game, Jaden is presented with five unique Jedi missions. These missions vary greatly and are spread across the galaxy. Jaden can take these missions in any order he desires and must only complete four of the five before being able to continue the main story of the game. Of course, I would highly recommend playing them all as their diversity is truly impressive and there are some fantastic Star Wars adventures awaiting the player. Impressive. Most impressive. When Jaden selects a mission, he is told the planet of the request and is given a brief bio outlining the mission objectives. On some of these missions, Jaden will be accompanied by Kyle, however most are handled solo. For this retrospective, I completed all of the available missions in their presented order for simplicity's sake in compiling the final video. And so we take our first Jedi mission, which is to investigate some mercenary activity in the infamous Moss Eisley Spaceport. Moss Eisley Spaceport. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. According to the mission's brief, this new group of Ragnos followers, dubbed the Disciples of Ragnos, has reportedly been attempting to hire mercenaries and smugglers to haul cargo. Believing these mercenaries might know where the cult's base of operations is, Kyle and Jaden are sent to investigate. Before we begin the mission, we are shown our Force Power screen, which allows us to put up to three points into eight separate Force abilities. These abilities are split between four light side and four dark side powers. The light side powers consist of Force Absorb, which absorbs dark side force attacks, Force Heal, which replenishes Jaden's health. Jedi Mind Trick, which can temporarily turn enemies against their comrades. Let me see your identification. You don't need to see his identification. We don't need to see his identification. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for. He can go about his business. You can go about your business. Move along. Move along. Move along and Force Protection, which makes Jaden more immune to damaging physical and Force attacks. The Dark Side abilities are made up of Force Drain, which drains the life essence of an enemy in order to heal Jaden, Force Lightning, that blasts enemies with a damaging burst of electricity, Force Rage, which increases Jaden's attack power and damage, and Force Grip, which is essentially Darth Vader's Force Choke and can also be used to throw enemies. Are you giving you clairvoyance enough to find the Rebels' hidden fort? I find your lack of faith disturbing. For this playthrough, I almost exclusively used the combination of Force Protection and Absorb, and found that it made later encounters against groups of lightsaber-armed, dark side wielding enemies far more manageable. There are eight additional Force abilities that consist of things such as the strength of Jaden's Force pull and push, as well as his offensive and defensive capabilities with a lightsaber. However, points cannot be added to these abilities, and they increase naturally over time as Jaden completes missions. After selecting a force power to upgrade, we are then shown the weapon selection screen. While Jaden is always armed with his lightsaber and DL-44 blaster, prior to every mission he will also be able to select two heavier weapons and one explosive to arm himself with. These heavier weapons range from the basic E-11 blaster used by common stormtroopers to a devastatingly powerful Stoker concussion rifle. The available weapons to choose from will increase as Jaden completes levels and encounters said weapons. Honestly, while I think this is a great system and does add variety, it feels a little pointless as for the vast majority of the game I find myself sticking to Jaden's lightsaber, which is in my opinion the most fun and immersive way to experience the game. That's not to say that the other weapons are bad by any means and there is a great variety to choose from. Every weapon even has two separate and distinct fire modes that add further variety to the gameplay. When you're playing as Jedi Apprentice though, it just feels almost blasphemous not to stick with the saber. What is it? It's your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. Not as clumsy or random as a blaster. An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. 
So begins our mercenary hunt in Mos Eisley. Upon arriving to the spaceport, Kyle and Jaden immediately locate an unoccupied Millennium Falcon, as well as a number of freelance mercenary cargo ships. Kyle and Jaden then separate, with Kyle heading to the Crate Cantina to ask around about the Disciples of Ragnos, while Jaden is instructed to guard the entrance to the docking bay containing the mercenary ships and detain anyone who enters. After Kyle leaves, Jaden encounters Chewbacca, who is in a gun battle with the mercenaries, and tells Jaden that he is on a mission from Princess Leia herself. The two then join forces and begin to battle the mercenary threat. This is where we will first see one of the game's many strengths, and that's a great enemy variety. Jaden and Chewbacca are immediately battling a variety of species, from Trandoshans to Rodians to Weequay to Gran, all of which wield a variety of weapons, including the insanely fast-firing Imperial Heavy Repeater to the powerful Wookiee Bowcaster. I like this thing. After killing a few of the mercenaries, they engage two tractor beams, one on the Millennium Falcon and one on Kyle's ship, the Raven's Claw, preventing the ships from being able to take off. Jaden and Chewbacca continue to battle their way through the spaceport, eventually splitting up. Chewbacca stays back in order to delay the mercenaries' advance as Jaden proceeds to the port's control tower in order to disengage the tractor beams and free the two ships. On our way to the tower, we do get a brief cameo from C-3PO and R2-D2, who are idling around the spaceport amongst the mercenaries for some unknown reason. Once we reach the tower, we discover the tractor beam controls guarded by another lightsaber-wielding disciple of Ragnos. After dispatching the disciple, Jaden proceeds back to the Falcon, reuniting with Chewbacca along the way. The level concludes as Jaden and Chewbacca finish off the remaining mercenaries guarding the Falcon and Kyle returns. Chewbacca greets Kyle and sings Jaden's praises as he gives him an aggressive Wookiee hug. Chewie, is that you? <laughs> Chewie! I can't see, pal. Kyle remarks that the mercenaries they encountered aren't cheap and that they may be being paid by the Imperial Remnant. Kyle and Jaden then head back to the Academy to tell Luke what they discovered, while Chewbacca is sent to warn Leia and the Republic about the Disciples of Ragnos. Back at the Academy, Luke remarks that it appears the Disciples of Ragnos and Imperial Remnant have allied together against the Republic. Just on a personal note, I have to say that I've always loved this period of Star Wars and the concept of multiple Imperial Remnant factions led by various Moths, Inquisitors, Admirals, Imperial Governors, etc. Not only fighting the New Republic, but infighting amongst themselves to rebuild the Empire the way they see fit is such a compelling concept. I think The Mandalorian has really done an excellent job to add to this concept with characters like Moff Gideon and allowing us to see the uneasy alliance between the various Imperial factions. Long live the Empire! Long live the Empire! The next mission, Droid Recovery, again takes place on Tatooine. The mission bio states that a moisture farmer recently overheard a conversation in a bar regarding a Sith cult. The farmer had his R5 droid record the conversation, but became afraid that the information may put his life in danger, and decided to sell the droid to Jawa Traders. Jaden's mission is to locate the Jawa Traders and buy the droid before its memory is wiped. Once on the planet, Kyle goes to speak with a farmer while Jaden is sent to track down the Jawa Sandcrawler. As we begin to make our way through the Desert Canyon, we immediately encounter a group of Jawas fleeing from our antagonist at the level, Tusken Raiders. Throughout the level, Tusken Raiders come in two enemy varieties, gaffy stick wielding melee combatants and cyclo rifle armed ranged units. The cyclo rifle units are by far the more irritating to deal with as they pester Jaden with accurate blaster fire from great distance while perched atop canyon maces and naturally formed rock archways. Jaden proceeds to battle his way through canyons, caves, and abandoned moisture farms, cutting down countless sand people along the way. <laughs> Eventually, Jaden locates the sand crawler, only to discover Jawas fleeing from it and the crawler overran with Tusken Raiders. Jaden makes his way into the sand crawler and begins to search for the missing R5 droid while clearing out Tusken Raider invaders and saving Jawas along the way. After locating the droid deep within the crawler, Jaden must escort the R5 unit back outside, battling the remainder of the Sand People warriors, eventually reuniting with Kyle and completing the mission. Once back at the academy, Luke tells us that he has discovered that his personal files were accessed by an unknown individual while he and Kyle were searching for the Crash Jedi student shuttle at the beginning of the game. Luke states that R2 is working to determine what the intruder was looking for in the files. We then cut to Jaden entering a commons area of the academy where he overhears Rosh telling other Jedi students that he feels like Kyle is holding him back to prevent him from becoming too powerful. Rosh asks Jaden his opinion when Kyle suddenly enters the room cutting the conversation short. The next mission takes place on Bakura, where local officials claim that a power station deep within the mountains has been taken control of by an unknown party. The Bakuran sent a security team to investigate the situation, but they have failed to report back. TK-421, why aren't you at your post? TK-421, do you copy? 
Jaden is tasked with infiltrating the facility and securing it back under Bakuran control. Jaden is also warned that the station must not be destroyed, as it's built over a dormant volcano and its destruction could set the volcano off, destroying a nearby city. Before leaving, Jaden is told by Luke that he will arrive on Bakura before Kyle and is instructed not to take any action until Kyle arrives. After arriving and waiting, however, Jaden decides that he can wait no longer and begins to explore the power station. After leaving his Z-95 Headhunter Starfighter, Jaden immediately discovers the dead and blaster scorched bodies of the Bakuran security team. Once Jaden enters the facility, he accesses the station's security cameras and learns that the station has been overtaken by Imperial Remnant forces. The Remnant is planting explosives throughout the facility and plans to destroy the power station in order to send a message to the New Republic. Jaden sets out to disarm the five bombs and is immediately attacked by a squad of stormtroopers. After defeating the troopers, we discover a new type of enemy, Imperial Commandos of personal cloaking devices that can turn invisible before ambushing Jaden. In order to locate and disarm the bombs, Jaden must follow the station's blue and orange fuel lines through the facility to the bomb's various locations. Along the way, Jaden will not only battle waves of Imperial stormtroopers and officers, but must also disable laser-activated trip mine booby traps in order to progress. Once all five bombs are disabled, Jaden must battle his way back to the Starfighter through waves of Imperial reinforcements. At the conclusion of the mission, we learn that Kyle never made it to Bakura, and that Luke has begun to receive numerous reports from across the galaxy concerning the Disciples of Ragnos. Jaden's next mission is to rescue a merchant on the planet of Blingeal. According to the mission brief, a merchant ship was pulled out of hyperspace by an Imperial Interdictor cruiser. If you're not familiar with these ships, they are a specially designed Imperial Star Destroyer that deploys an interdiction field capable of ripping passing ships directly out of hyperspace. Once the merchant ship was pulled from hyperspace, the Interdictor opened fire on the freighter, damaging it and causing it to crash land on Blingeal. Thus begins one of, in my opinion, the best and most memorable levels of the entire game due to its uniqueness. The level begins as we see Jaden's shuttle entering Blingeal's atmosphere. Jaden's landing is cut short though as the shuttle is struck by lightning, disabling the ship and causing it to crash land alongside the downed merchant vessel. We cut to the inside of the shuttle where Jaden is inspecting the damage. We can see that several of the ship's components have been damaged and are strewn across the ground. Jaden exits the shuttle and encounters one of the merchants who appears frightened and runs towards Jaden. Before the merchant can reach Jaden's shuttle though, a massive sand burrow or space worm devours the unfortunate trader. And so the level begins, with Jaden's objected to retrieve four replacement components from the merchant's vessel to repair his ship and escape the planet. In order to do this, Jaden must platform across the crash site, staying on top of ship components or rocks, in order to avoid being eaten by the massive sand dwelling worm. <laughs> Jaden can only carry one component at a time, so multiple trips must be made across the deadly surface of the planet. This is such a unique idea for a level and does a perfect job of combining a solidly designed platforming level along with great tension as we move and hear the ground rumbling behind us and the roars of the massive beast as it just misses swallowing us whole. Once the ship is repaired, Jaden contacts Kyle, who says he will notify the Republic on Coruscant to mark the planet as hazardous. The final mission of the game's first segment is set on Corellia, in Coronet City. According to the mission brief, the city has sent multiple reports of Disciples of Ragnos being active in the city. It is unclear, however, if the reports are accurate or just paranoia, as the story of the Disciples has now been played on Holonet News. Kyle and Jaden are sent to investigate the city and confirm the reports. The level begins with Kyle and Jaden aboard the Raven Squall, speeding through the city's skyscrapers as rain washes over the cockpit's window. Kyle is telling Jaden the story of his former partner Jan when a frantic message suddenly comes across the ship's comms. The message is a plea for help, stating that their tram is under attack and the attackers are planting explosives in order to destroy the vessel. Kyle states that the message is coming from a cargo tram below them and we observe one of the freelance mercenary cargo ships previously seen on Tatooine. The ship hovers over the tram as a group of mercenaries are deployed. Prepare to drop. Kyle tells Jaden that he will drop him off on the tram to deal with the mercenaries and disable the bomb while he battles the enemy ships using the Raven's Claw. The level begins as Jaden is dropped off on the tram's rear car and begins to work his way to the front of the train. This level has some incredible effects that make it feel as if the tram is moving at an incredibly high rate of speed. When Jaden walks forward, he places his arm across his face to block the wind and rain, and the camera shakes just the right amount to create the effect of wind blowing strongly against Jaden's body. We also get the previously mentioned rain effects, with droplets of rain sizzling and popping into steam as they make contact with Jaden's lightsaber. All of the effects are made even better when you realize that the game only uses them when Jaden is outside of a tram car. 
Once he goes inside, all of the environmental effects stop and Jaden moves around normally. When outside of the tram, we also get a background of the city skyscrapers zipping by, only further adding to the feeling of speed. And so Jaden begins to platform his way from tram car to tram car, battling waves of mercenaries along the way. <laughs> Along the way, Jane can occasionally see Kyle engaged in dogfights above the tram, destroying the mercenary ships and even celebrating over the comm as he does so. Near the front of the tram, Jaden locates the bomb, which is guarded by one of the disciples of Ragnos. Kyle tells Jaden to disarm the bomb quickly as they are approaching a heavily populated area of the city. With the disciple dead and the bomb disabled, Kyle then informs Jaden that the mercenaries are speeding the tram up and he believes they are going to crash the train to the approaching station. Jaden must now reach the tram's control room and activate the brakes. On arriving at the tram's controls, Jaden finds them guarded by another disciple. Once the disciple is defeated and the tram's brakes are activated, the level ends as Kyle tells you that he took out all the mercenary cargo ships. With all five of the first segment's missions complete, we then start our next main story mission, with Luke assembling the Jedi Masters and students back on Yavin. Luke tells the assembled Jedi that the person who accessed his personal data took files concerning places that Luke had felt an especially strong connection to the Force on his adventures across the galaxy. Luke believes the strange scepter seen by Jaden shooting the orange beam into the side of the Masasi Temple is being used to drain the residual force energy from these locations. Luke says that he has read accounts on Jedi holocrons of ancient devices used to absorb and store force energy. In order to figure out what the Disciples' plan is, Luke states that he is sending everyone on missions to investigate these locations. Kyle is sent to investigate the Valley of the Jedi, Rosh is sent to the remains of Biss, the former capital of the Galactic Empire after the Battle of Endor, and Jaden is sent to Hoth, where Luke first encountered the Force Ghost of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hello. And so Jaden travels to Hoth. We look on as he enters the planet's atmosphere in his Z-95 headhunter and flies into a blinding blizzard. Jaden lands his starfighter and begins scanning the area. As he scans the area, he notices a blinking beacon in the distance and decides to investigate further. As Jaden moves to follow the beacon, he immediately runs into a herd of Tauntauns, which can be mounted and ridden to cover ground more quickly. Steady! Hey! Steady, girl! Hey, what's the matter? Can you smell something? After a short trek, Jaden comes across a campground occupied by a squad of Imperial Snow Troopers. After dispatching the troopers, Jaden continues to follow the beacons and enters a large ice cave occupied by a vicious wampa. In true Mark Hamill fashion, I decided to leave the wampa alone, and Jaden even states to the beast, I don't want to hurt you. We continue on to yet another Imperial camp and face a new enemy, an Imperial probe droid, which hovers around the camp, sporadically blasting at Jaden. The probe droid is dispatched easily enough for the thrown lightsaber, causing it to self-destruct. Eventually, Jaden finds himself in the ruins of the Hoth battlefield, which is strewn with fallen AT-ATs and mechanical debris. Jaden also encounters an ATSD for the first time on the battlefield. Using a nearby E-Web heavy repeating blaster cannon, Jaden is able to make short work of the Scout Walker before continuing to investigate the planet's surface. Moving forward, Jaden discovers that the ATST was guarding an entrance into Echo Base and is able to enter the abandoned Rebel Fortress, which of course is crawling with Imperial forces. A short ways into the base, Jaden locates the Ion Cannon Control Terminal and can even activate it and fire the massive cannon. Stand by Ion Control. Fire. After clearing this portion of Echo Base, we end up back outside where we get a great set piece battle in which Jane can quickly mount an E Web cannon in order to take out a huge group of advancing snow troopers. Working our way back across the battlefield ruins, we discover the Imperials defending a destroyed ATAT. On further inspection, we discover that the Imperials have created a hidden entrance into the subterranean levels of Echo Base inside the Fallen Walker. On re entering the base, we get to see more of the iconic locations, such as the medical wing, where the glowing blue back to tanks are still active and look fantastic. After severely depleting the Imperial Snowtrooper Corps, Jaden finds himself in the Echo Base control room. In the control room, he overhears a disciple speaking via comm to someone named Allura. The disciple tells Allura that using the base's computer, he has determined that after the Battle of Hoth, Luke fled the planet and went to Dagobah. After defeating the Disciple, Jaden faces off against Allura, who is revealed to be the red-skinned Twi'lek who stole Luke's data files. We learn that Allura is the dark side apprentice of the Disciple's leader, and the two plan to meet on Dagobah. After a short duel with Allura, she flees from Jaden, jumping through an opening high in the ceiling. 
This concludes the Hoth level, but I have to say I love all of the easter eggs and environmental storytelling this level gives us. Getting to explore the ruins of the battlefield, ride a Tauntaun, fire the Ion Cannon, and see iconic locations like the base's medical wing and command center are incredible, and after replaying the game I can easily say that this was my favorite level of the entire adventure. After returning to the academy, Kyle asked Jaden if he was able to locate anything on Hoth, and Jaden informs him that it seemed the force energy of the site had already been drained prior to his arrival. Luke states that he's received similar reports from the other Jedi sent to investigate sites. It is then revealed that Rosh has not returned from Biss. Luke states that he can sense that he is still alive through the Force and Kyle sets out to locate him. Before the meeting concludes, Jaden is promoted from Padawan to Jedi Apprentice. With Luke on his way to Dagobah and Kyle headed to Biss, Jaden continues taking missions across the galaxy, starting with locating a group of missing elders on Nar Krita. According to the mission brief, the elders are part of the planet's mining guild and went to negotiate with a local hut crime lord. <laughs> The elders disappeared and the hut claims they never arrived. The level begins as Jaden gains entry into the hut's palace through a large drainage pipe. We are told as the mission starts that Narkrita is near Biss, so Kyle will make a detour to assist in the mission. Jaden is instructed by Kyle to locate the elders and send them back down the drain pipe where Kyle will pick them up on the Raven's Claw. Jaden makes his way through the drainage pipe into a ventilation shaft where he overhears two guards talking about the bets they have placed on the prisoners. One of the guards states that he didn't place a bed as most prisoners don't even make it 10 meters before being eaten by the Rancor. Jaden then breaks through the ventilation shaft grate and begins to battle his way through the crime ward's forces as he searches for the imprisoned elders. After clearing a security room, Jaden discovers that the 16 missing elders have been split into groups of four and are being forced to run through a massive maze-like arena that houses the Rancor. Jaden must open the elders' cells, releasing four of them at a time into the arena, and then lead the groups through the maze, avoiding the Rancor, and making it back to the exit in the Raven's Claw. Along the way, Jaden can attack the Rancor in order to distract the beast and give the elders a chance to escape. If the Rancor catches up to Jaden, it will grab him, and Jaden must frantically stab the creature's hand with his lightsaber in order to free himself before being eaten. <laughs> After escorting the first group back to the Raven's Claw, Jaden makes his way into the palace's bedding parlor and cantina as he attempts to locate the three remaining groups of elders. The bedding parlor is incredibly well decorated, the bright neon signs betraying the Rancor, and bedding tickets spread across the bar. There is even an easter egg to Jedi Outcast, as the bartender appears to be the same Chiss encountered by Kyle on Nar Shaddaa. Just as with Ben Jill, I think this is a fantastically designed and unique level that really stands out in a game full of great missions. The Rancor is large, faster than you would think, and a very intimidating enemy to encounter. If the game has one weakness, it's probably the Elder's AI, as they sometimes seem to run directly towards the Rancor, take strange paths to exit the arena, or completely stop, allowing the beast to catch up to them. <laughs> Overall though, this is a great level and very memorable. The level concludes as we escort the last of the Elders to the Raven's Claw and Jaden boards the ship as well. The next mission takes place on Zonju 5 where a spaceport worker has vital information regarding the connection between the Disciples of Ragnos and the Imperial Remnant. The worker is hiding in an abandoned outpost 3 kilometers outside the city of Zorin Head. The level begins as we see Jaden buying a swoop bike and heading towards the outpost. Jane is immediately attacked by mercenaries on their own swoops and must battle them on his way to meet with the spaceport worker. Jaden's swoop has a forward-facing blaster cannon that can be used to shoot the enemy swoops. <laughs> Additionally, Jaden can use his swoop to force enemies into walls or columns, causing them to crash and explode. Jane can also use his lightsaber to slash nearby riders off their bikes, killing them. The swoop is essential for combat during this mission, as Jaden can be run over and killed instantly by enemy swoops if he dismounts his vehicle. While on the swoop, Jane can use a secondary fire option for a speed boost, which can be used to jump the bike across large gaps. Occasionally, Jaden will leave behind a swoop to pass over obstacles such as a large gate blocking the entrance of the hidden worker's outpost. Jaden will locate additional swoops throughout the mission, though, that can be taken to replace Jaden's destroyed or damaged bike. Upon arriving to the outpost, Jaden locates the worker, who asks him to come inside where it's safe to talk. Before the two can enter the outpost, though, the worker is shot and killed by a mercenary sniper. With the informant dead and the route back blocked, Jaden mounts a new swoop and begins to take an alternative canyon path back to Zorin Head. The level then becomes a running battle back to the city, with Jaden taking on wave after wave of relentless swoop bike mercenaries. The canyons do have some nice environmental touches to look at along the way, such as ancient ruins, and the giant rib cage of some massive deceased creature large enough to be flown through. Upon arrival back to Zorin Head, Jaden contacts Kyle and tells him of the informant's fate. 
Kyle tells Jaden that he's unsure what Luke's incursion on Dagobah has unearthed, but he has discovered that Rosh has been captured by the disciples. However, he has no idea where the cultists have taken him. Jaden's next mission is a covert operation on Krildor, in which Jaden must team up with General Wedge Antilles, the leader of Rogue Squadron. Wedge and Jaden must take control of a secret Imperial Tabana gas platform in order to weaken the Imperial Remnant forces in the area. Wedge has come up with a plan to take control of the station using only his sole X-Wing fighter and one soldier on foot. Due to the extreme danger of the mission, Wedge thinks the foot soldier has to be a Jedi in order for the mission to succeed. The level begins as Jaden and his headhunter and Wedge and his X-Wing enter Krildor's atmosphere. Jaden lands on the platform and is instructed by Wedge to place beacons on the station's key structural points so that Wedge can destroy them using his fighter, leaving the station defenseless. Jaden's first target is the station's chilled generator. Jaden enters the facility through a TIE fighter hangar and begins to battle the Inferior forces along the way to his target. Along the way, Jaden encounters Imperial jetpack troopers for the first time, who attack from the sky using the fast-shooting Imperial heavy repeater. After placing the first beacon, Wedge flies in, blowing up the shield generator with a proton torpedo. That got him! I see it, Wedge. Good work. Jaden is then sent to the nearby TIE fighter hangar where another beacon is planted and Wedge proceeds with a second bombing run. Jaden next makes his way to the roof of the trooper garrison where a third beacon is planted and the building destroyed. With the garrison destroyed, Jaden is sent to the communications array to prevent the Imperials from calling for reinforcements. Once the communications array is destroyed, Jaden is instructed to proceed to the power generator, which once destroyed will disable the station's turbo lasers. With the generator destroyed and the station's defenses offline, Jaden proceeds to his final target, the command center. Jaden battles his way back to the station, encountering more jetpack troopers along the way. On entering the command station, Jaden discovers that he is guarded by one of the disciples, and another lightsaber duel ensues. After killing the disciples and destroying the command center, Wedge tells Jaden that the Imperials are planting bombs on the Tabana gas storage tanks in order to prevent the Republic from acquiring the valuable fuel. In order to complete the mission, Jaden must defeat the remaining Imperial forces and disable the four bombs. With the Imperial forces defeated and the Tabana gas secured, the level concludes as Jaden makes his way back to his fighter and leaves the station. Wedge tells us that the Republic has troops en route to take control of the station and ensure that it doesn't fall back into the hands of the Disciples or the Empire. Luke then tells Jaden that he has returned from Dagobah, where he discovered that the Disciples had already siphoned the Force energy from the planet. The next mission finds Jaden headed to the sprawling city streets of Coruscant, where Jaden must investigate reports of illegal assassin droids being constructed and sold on the planet's black market. The assassin droid manufacturing is believed to be under the direction of small-time human crime ward Lanik Rakto. Jaden is instructed to capture Rakto so that he can be questioned and his illegal factory located. As the mission starts and Jaden lands on Coruscant, he immediately encounters Lanik, who knows of Jaden's mission. Using planned explosives, Lanik destroys a bridge separating the two before fleeing back into his secured office building. With the bridge destroyed, Jaden must then find an alternate route to the office, platform around skyscrapers of the city, and battling Lanik's thugs along the way. This is a solid Coruscant level in my opinion with great lighting, design, and some interesting callbacks such as a Coro 2 airspeeder parked on a platform, the same speeder flown by Zam Wessel as she fled from Anakin and Obi-Wan on Coruscant in Attack of the Clones. My one biggest complaint on the Coruscant level versus other portrayals in Star Wars games is complete lack of background air traffic and civilian NPCs. While I can look past the lack of NPCs as we are in the area of a crime ward's office building, the lack of air traffic makes the planet seem a little barren and dead, exactly the opposite of how the bustling city planet should be portrayed. <laughs> Air traffic aside though, the level has some solid and well designed platforming that is fun to pull off. On our way back to Lanik's office, we encounter our first assassin droid. These droids are almost impervious to blaster fire and have an electrical shield that envelops them every few seconds. If Jaden is too close and the droid activates the shield, he will be hit with a powerful electrical blast that can kill him instantly. In order to defeat the droid, Jaden must time his lightsaber attacks between the shield's activations, eventually destroying the mechanical assassin. After battling his way through waves of thugs and additional assassin droids, Jaden eventually arrives at the office building's entrance. Upon entering the building, Jaden finds himself in a large lobby facing off against two disciples of Ragnos. One of the disciples is the same orange guard type we have fought throughout the game. The other disciple, however, is a new enemy type, a blue clothed disciple that is unarmed, but instead uses powerful force attacks to damage Jaden, such as Force Grip, which he uses to lift Jaden off the ground, inflicting choking damage. If Jaden tries to engage the disciple at close range, he employs powerful force pushes to keep Jaden at bay. The trick to defeating these foes that I found is most effective throughout my playthrough was to upgrade Jaden's force absorbability, making him essentially immune to incoming force attacks. With absorb enabled, Jaden can quickly close the distance on these force wielders and cut them down with ease. 
With the disciples dead, Jaden continues into Lanik's plush office, adorned with ancient antiquities and mounted trophies. Lanik is not defenseless, though, and activates a trap, securing himself inside a solid, durasteel chamber while simultaneously activating four of his fearsome, shielded assassin droids. <laughs> Jaden must then battle and destroy the four droids before Lanik's barrier can be raised and the crime ward captured. With the droids defeated, Jaden places Lanik under arrest as the criminal reveals the secret location of his droid factory to be the Hut control world of Nar Shaddaa. With the level complete, Kyle tells Jaden the New Republic agent successfully raided and shut down the illegal droid factory, ending the production of the deadly machines. The final mission of this segment of the game is to investigate possible cult activity on the planet of Dosan. Details are sparse for this mission, simply stating that suspicious transmissions believed to be originating from the Disciples have been intercepted coming from the planet's surface. With no Republic fleets in the area, the Jedi have been tasked with investigating the incident. The level begins with Jaden on the planet's surface, walking away from his starfighter. We can see that Jaden has landed in some kind of fortified facility. As Jaden is walking, a group of cloaked Imperials suddenly appears, surrounding Jaden with sniper rifles drawn. We then see Rax Joris, a corrupt Imperial army officer, standing atop one of the fortified buildings of the compound. Joris demands that Jaden surrender, which he does. We then cut to Jaden locked in an Imperial prison cell. Joris approaches the cell holding Jaden's lightsaber and states that he has a proposition for him. Joris tells Jaden that he is bored, so he's going to release Jaden from his cell. If Jaden can make it to his starfighter, he will be allowed to leave the planet. However, Joris will be hunting the unarmed Jaden, and if he catches him before he reaches his ship, he will kill him. The next scene sees Jaden escaping his now open cell and beginning to work his way through the Imperial camp. I love the setup for this level, and it's completely unique in the game as the only level where Jaden begins his mission without his lightsaber, instead forcing him to rely on blasters and his force powers in order to succeed. Thankfully, after escaping his cell, Jaden quickly locates a weapons rack containing several E-11 blaster rifles and arms himself. He then begins to blast his way through the compound's many stormtroopers. <laughs> A short distance from his holding cell, Jaden encounters Joris, who immediately begins blasting at Jaden using the devastating Stoker concussion rifle. In order to escape the weapon's deadly fire, Jaden must flee into the base's main garrison, while simultaneously, Joris issues an announcement over the compound's intercom, advising all personnel of an escape prisoner. Jaden immediately begins to encounter more Imperial forces as they rush to search the facility. Jaden battles his way to Joris' office, where he disables the station's security lockdown, allowing him to gain access to the docking bay where his ship is being held. On the way to the bay, Jaden faces off against wave after wave of stormtroopers, Imperial officers, and even TIE fighter pilots. Using an E-Web cannon, Jaden is able to blast through one of the garrison's interior walls in order to gain access to the main courtyard of the base. Unfortunately for Jaden, the courtyard is guarded by a patrolling ATST. Using a stack of explosive crates, Jaden is able to blast through an exterior wall of another of the facility's nearby buildings and escape the attacking scout transport. After proceeding to the top of the building, Jaden again encounters Joris, who opens fire on him as he runs across the building's roof on his way towards the docking bay. After making his way across the roof, Jaden finally locates the docking base. Unfortunately for Jaden, Joris is there waiting for him. Joris tells Jaden he was never going to allow him to leave and let the Republic find out about his operation. Our final boss fight with Joris then begins as Jaden must platform his way up a series of catwalks and walkways in order to reach and defeat Joris to the top. This is easier said than done though, as Joris' concussion rifle blast not only damaged Jaden, but also emit a powerful shockwave that can throw him from a platform to the ground below. Eventually, Jaden is able to make his way to the top of the bay and defeat Joris, whose last words are that he underestimated Jaden. Jaden recovers his lightsaber and the level ends. After the completion of the mission, Kyle congratulates Jaden on his survival and tells him that the New Republic has forces en route to take care of the remaining Imperial forces on Dasan. With all five levels of the game's second segment complete, Jaden then proceeds back to the Jedi Academy where Luke is holding an assembly to outline his plan to battle the Disciples of Ragnos. Luke tells the gathered Jedi that he believes the Disciples have pieced together clues from his past in order to locate other Force-sensitive locations which he encountered throughout his journeys but did not document in his data pad. Thus, Luke plans to split the Jedi forces into teams of two to investigate these additional locations. Kyle and Jaden are then assigned to the planet Vajun, which Kyle says is a dead rock. Luke then reveals that Vajun once housed a stronghold of his father, Darth Vader. Director Krennic. Lord Vader. You seem unsettled. Luke warns Kyle and Jaden to be cautious that the dark side is strong on Vajun, even oppressive. The level begins as the two Jedi enter the planet's yellowish green atmosphere in the Raven's Claw and approach a large palace. Kyle states the castle appears to be occupied and tells Jaden that they will settle down in a nearby canyon and try to sneak in the facility. Once Kyle and Jaden exit the ship, they immediately discover that the planet is being drenched in a storm of damaging acid rain. The Jedi are able to use force protection to counter the damage, however if the force power wears off, Jaden will begin to take small amounts of continuous damage. 
Thus the Jedi must move from cover to cover, allowing their force meters to replenish and remain protected. As Kyle and Jaden begin to move through the canyon, they immediately encounter Imperial Hazard Troopers. These massive, lumbering soldiers are cybernetically enhanced stormtroopers outfitted with nearly indestructible environmental hazard suits, able to withstand acid, extreme temperatures, and even poisonous atmospheres. <laughs> The Hazard Troopers are also armed with the previously mentioned and devastating concussion rifles. Kyle and Jaden make their way towards the main castle, clearing numerous smaller Imperial outposts along the way. These outposts are heavily guarded and crawling with Stormtroopers, Imperial officers, disciples of Ragnos, and even more of the heavily armored Hazard Troopers. Vajun is undoubtedly one of the game's more noticeable difficulty spikes, not just throwing more enemies numerically against Jaden, but also more powerful enemies. Eventually the Jedi find the canyon path cut off by a pair of TIE bombers. Jaden must battle his way into yet another nearby Imperial outpost in order to seize the station's turbo laser and shoot down the enemy starships. Just outside the door of the turbo laser, Jaden encounters a new, more powerful type of disciple. These blue-garbed, lightsaber-wielding warriors are far more powerful than their orange-clad brethren and also wield dark side force abilities in battle. <laughs> As the first disciple able to employ both lightsaber and force attacks against Jaden, this makes for a fun and challenging duel. After defeating the disciple, Jaden mounts the awaiting turbo laser and makes short work of the two TIE bombers, clearing the canyon and the Jedi's path forward. At the end of the canyon, Kyle and Jaden enter the underworks of Vader's former palace, known as Bast Castle. With the castle's turbo list disabled, the Jedi make their way down into the facility's garbage chute as they search for a way into the higher levels of the structure. What an incredible smell you've discovered! Unfortunately for Jaden, even the castle's underworks are heavily guarded by Imperials and Disciples alike. In a nice break from fighting, we do get a simple puzzle area where Jaden must use the Force in order to activate pumps and drain knee-deep water out of a flooded room, as Kyle uses the Force to prevent a massive electrical power conduit from falling into the water and killing the two Jedi. While it's an extremely simple segment, even calling it a puzzle is a stretch, I still thought it was a nice contrast to simply cutting down waves of enemies as fun as that can be in Jedi Academy. Kyle and Jane continue making their way higher and higher into the castle, using the powerful draft of ventilation tubes to propel themselves upward while battling floating security droids along the way. Eventually, the two Jedi find their way into a large generator room, where Jaden is able to divert the machine's power back into itself, causing a large explosion and creating an entrance into the main part of the castle. Unfortunately, the explosion also knocked a portion of the generator's catwalk away, with Kyle along with it, meaning that Jaden must continue into Bass Castle alone. On entering the castle, Jaden immediately finds himself in a large red glowing sanctuary that seems like it was pulled straight from Vader's castle on Mustafar. Unsurprisingly, the castle is completely overrun with disciples who ambush Jaden relentlessly along the way. While challenging, this does allow for some of the game's most fantastic and memorable lightsaber duels. Later in the castle's hangar bay, we encounter our first dual lightsaber wielding disciple, which again makes for an exciting new challenge and showdown. Just after the dual wielding disciple, Jaden enters Darth Vader's training room where he must battle waves of droids in order to progress. These droids include IT-0 interrogator droids that can jab Jaden with a poisonous syringe draining his health and temporarily distorting his vision, the shielded assassin droids previously battled on Coruscant, and even lightsaber arm training droids such as the one activated by Ross during the Yavin obstacle course. After Jaden clears the training room, he then finds himself in Vader's throne room where a large statue of the former Dark Jedi can be seen destroyed in pieces across the stone floor. At the top floor of the throne room, Jaden encounters yet another new and challenging opponent, the powerful dual-blade lightsaber-wielding disciple. After defeating the dual-wielding warrior, Jaden enters the final room of the castle where he discovers one of Vader's meditation chambers, such as the one seen in The Empire Strikes Back. What is it, General? as well as Rosh and two heavily muscled disciples. Rosh appears to be using the scepter in order to drain the meditation chamber of its latent force aura. Jaden confronts Rosh, who proceeds to tell him of the incredible power of the dark side, bragging that he was correct and Kyle had been holding him back from his true potential. Jaden tells Rosh that he is a Jedi, and for a moment Rosh appears conflicted. However, the two large disciples then step in and order Rosh to eliminate Jaden. Rosh obeys, igniting his now red-bladed lightsaber and attacking his former ally. The duel with Rosh is a fast-paced and exciting battle, made even more so after striking Rosh down for the first time, only to discover that he will be fully healed by the two hulking disciples who blast Rosh with red glowing force aura. Thus, Jaden must first defeat Rosh's two guards before battling the former Padawan himself. With the guards defeated, Jaden can then battle Rosh one-on-one, -on -one, defeating him as Kyle arrives into the meditation chamber. 
Victory is short-lived, though, as both Kyle and Jaden are suddenly incapacitated by a powerful burst of force lightning. We then discover that the leader of the Disciples of Ragnos is none other than Tavion, the former apprentice of Dasan of the Empire Reborn faction. For anyone unfamiliar with what I'm referring to, Dasan was the primary antagonist of the game Jedi Outcast, who was defeated and killed by Kyle. Kyle also defeated Tavion during the events of the game during a duel on Bespin, but spared her life. Tavion mocks Kyle for sparing her life, stating that his Jedi mercy is a weakness that will cost him his life and the life of his students at the Academy. Realizing that Tavion is about to kill Kyle, Jaden throws his lightsaber into the ceiling of the meditation chamber, causing the roof to cave in while also destroying Jaden's lightsaber. Jaden's distraction is enough to give the Jedi a chance to escape, ending the level. Kyle and Jaden then return to the Academy to inform Luke of their discovery, telling him that they're not sure where Tavion and Rosh had gone after fleeing Vajun. Luke states that he does not understand how Tavion has been able to amass such a large number of Force-sensitive warriors, to which Jaden proposes a theory that perhaps the Scepter is being used to empower her followers with the Force. Jaden believes that the Scepter can absorb Force energy, perhaps it can also release it into living beings. As the meeting concludes, Jaden is promoted to the rank of Jedi Knight and told by Luke that he must construct a new lightsaber. As Jaden leaves the audience chamber, Kyle again warns him of the dangers of the dark side of the Force. Jaden is then able to construct a new lightsaber and can now choose between a traditional single-bladed saber, dual sabers, or a double-bladed lightsaber. For this playthrough, I chose green-bladed dual sabers. The next mission takes place on Chandrilla, where locals report that disciples have broken into the burial site of an ancient Jedi Knight. Jaden must proceed to the tomb and stop the disciples before they're able to siphon off the force energy of the fallen knight. The level begins as Jaden falls down into the deep depths of a subterranean tomb. As Jaden makes his way into the catacombs, we discover that the site has already been overrun by the Disciples, who immediately begin an all-out onslaught against Jaden. Personally, I think this is one of the most difficult levels of the game as it is filled to the brim with lightsaber duels, which as stated earlier can end in an instant kill death if Jaden is struck in the right place. While challenging, the level is a great deal of fun and finds Jaden having to platform his way lower and lower into the depths of the tomb in order to reach the Jedi's burial site. In order to reach the lower levels, Jaden must platform across narrow, unstable stone walkways that sometimes crumble away underfoot, requiring Jaden to quickly react and avoid falling to his death in the massive cavern. This can be used to kill disciples as well, as they can be forced thrown off the edge of the walkways and will sometimes accidentally jump to their own deaths while trying to avoid Jaden's attacks. After clearing several groups of disciples, Jaden is able to use his force sense in order to pull open a huge stone door which seals the Jedi's grave. Jaden works his way deeper and deeper into the cavern, battling disciples every step of the way. I actually got a little tired of lightsaber duels at this point and started blasting disciples from a distance with a concussion rifle. I should mention this level is very well designed with fun platforming and visually looks great and unique to the rest of the game with a darker, somber atmosphere perfect for a tomb. The tomb is decorated with gothic statues holding lanterns of blue fire that cast an eerie glow throughout the cavern. Eventually Jaden locates the resting place of the fallen Jedi, and after defeating the double blade lightsaber wielding disciple guarding the grave, he is able to reseal the crystal laden tomb using the force. The mission ends as Jaden flees from the tomb as it begins to cave in Indiana Jones style for some unknown reason. At the conclusion of the mission, Kyle tells Jaden that they cannot simply keep cleaning up Tavian's destruction, but must find and defeat her once and for all. Kyle also tells Jaden that he discovered how Tavian obtained the scepter, stating that she took it from a collector on Commoner before killing him. The next mission is a cold investigation on Tanab. According to the brief, a freighter captain reported seeing a number of cultists at the Tanab spaceport. Jaden is sent to investigate the report further. As Jaden arrives at the spaceport, he immediately encounters a lone disciple opening a large bay door and lowering an energy shield containing a massive beast. Upon closer inspection, we see that the beast is a raincore that has been heavily modified with cybernetic attachments. <laughs> Once 
freed, the Rancor instantly attacks and eats the Disciple before setting its sights on Jaden. And so begins yet another very unique level in which we must find a way to destroy the raging mutated Rancor as it proceeds to destroy the spaceport and eat anyone it encounters. As Jaden platforms over shipping containers to make his way through the spaceport, he is bombarded by Disciples attempting to engage him in combat. Jaden must choose his battles wisely, however, as the enraged Rancor pursues him relentlessly. While fleeing for the beast, Jaden must activate several switches to gain access to other bays in the spaceport as he searches for a way to kill the giant creature. While running from the Rancor, we learn that not only can the beast grab and eat Jaden, but can also spit large plumes of acid that melt through Jaden's health with ease. As with the previously encountered Rancor, if Jaden is grabbed, he can quickly slash away at the Rancor's hand and escape before being eaten. Eventually, Jaden comes up with a plan to trap the Rancor in a large conveyor belt, dropping a storage container behind the creature and forcing it into a powerful energy shield. Jaden locates the conveyor belt's control terminal, dueling and dispatching the disciples guarding the room before taking control of the mechanism. Using the terminal, Jaden drops a large container onto the moving belt, which forces the Rancor into the energy field, killing the beast. <laughs> There really isn't a ton to break down this mission, it's easily one of the shortest and most straightforward missions of the game. I do think however that again it's very unique and well designed with great tension and atmosphere and is one of the game's more memorable missions. With the Rancor dead, Jane reports back to Kyle who tells him that the Disciples were planning to release the monster into the city in order to create havoc and then steal whatever they could during the ensuing chaos. Kyle ends the transmission telling Jaden that he and Luke still do know what Tavian plans to do with the Ragnos Scepter and to keep his ears open. The next mission sees Jaden headed deep into wild space to the cloaked and hidden planet of Yolara. The scholar of Luke's new Jedi Academy, Tione, recently learned of the planet from a Jedi holocron. According to the holocron, the planet was home to a peaceful yet primitive species that the ancient Jedi did not believe were ready to integrate into society. It was for this reason that Jedi Master Broden Kelverdox used the planet's own energy to create a powerful cloaking device strong enough to hide the entire planet. Fearing that the Disciples of Ragnos may locate Yolara and harness the power of the device, Jaden is sent to investigate the planet and, if necessary, to destroy the device in order to prevent it from falling into the hands of the Disciples. Jaden arrives on the planet, landing on a massive dam overlooking a vast scenic valley. On top of the dam, a large tower has been constructed, and while the site appears abandoned, the tower and cloaking device are still powered and functional. On entering the tower, Jaden discovers that he is not alone as he encounters a Nogri warrior, one of Vader and later Grand Admiral Thrawn's elite race of assassins. The Nogri demands that Jaden leave the planet before attacking the Jedi with a strange weapon firing green toxins. After defeating the warrior, Jaden begins to make his way through the power station, battling his way up the structure against more of the fearsome Nogri assassins. Deeper into the facility, Jaden discovers that the Imperial Remnant has already arrived and are themselves fighting against the Nogri warriors. Working his way through the warring factions, Jaden is able to disable a large ventilation fan, allowing him to continue his progression upwards towards the tower's peak. As he rises through the tower, he again encounters and duels against more disciples who are aiding the Imperial forces. Per usual at this point in the game, some of these disciple duels are true tests of the player's abilities and are an exciting challenge. As Jaden proceeds, he faces off against tougher and tougher waves of enemies, namely the elite double blade lightsaber and dual blade lightsaber disciples. On finally arriving at the tower's peak, Jaden locates the cloaking device as the Nogri and disciples battle over the mechanism. Realizing that the location of the planet has been compromised, Jaden decides to destroy the powerful cloaking device, planting several explosives at its base and jumping from the tower as the mechanism explodes behind him. Blow this shield. The Empire will really have him up against the wall. Archers, come on! Come on! With the mission complete, Jane reports to Luke who tells him that he believes Vader must have ordered the Nogri to the planet before his death in order to gain control of the device. With Vader dead, the Nogri had been faithfully protecting the device and awaiting Vader's orders for over a decade. Jaden's next mission is a forced theft investigation near the ruins of Biss. Due to Rosh's capture, he was never able to complete his mission to investigate the planet's remains and determine if the Disciples were able to siphon off the planet's residual dark side energy. Kyle believes that knowing whether or not Tavion did manage to siphon off the power will help the Jedi determine her acquired strength. Kyle also advises Jaden that Biss is too dangerous of a location to investigate alone and that he will be accompanying him on this mission. The level begins with Kyle and Jaden aboard the Raven's Claw, discussing how they don't sense the dark side emanating from the planet's ruins as they should. With the knowledge that Tavion was able to siphon the force from Biss, the two Jedi prepare to leave when an Imperial Dreadnought suddenly appears and envelops the Raven's Claw in a tractor beam, capturing the vessel. As the Raven's Claw is brought aboard, Kyle states that he once served aboard a Dreadnought during his days as an Imperial officer. Kyle formulates a plan, instructing Jaden to disable the ship's tractor beam while he triggers the vessel's self-destruct mechanism.
I'll start by saying that I really enjoy this level and it just feels like a classic Star Wars adventure, fighting through an Imperial vessel in order to disable a tractor beam, and is a clear homage to the Death Star incursion of A New Hope. The level begins in the Dreadnought's hangar bay, where Jaden begins to explore the ship as Kyle cuts through a blast door, Qui-Gon Jinn style. They are still coming through! This is impossible! Unsurprisingly, the Jedi is packed to the brim with Imperial troops of all kinds, including the beastly cybernetic hazard troopers, which are even more threatening in the cramped quarters of the ship. It's not long before Jaden locates and disables the tractor beam. Unfortunately, Kyle advises that the Dreadnought was able to send out a distress signal, and Imperial fighters are en route to intercept the vessel. To counter the attack, Jaden must battle his way to the ship's turbo laser controls and engage the fighters himself. After slashing his way through wave after wave of Imperial soldier, Jaden eventually locates the turbo laser control room and mounts one of the powerful turrets. We then get a really fun turret section where Jaden must destroy a squadron of attacking TIE fighters before moving on. <laughs> With the fighters destroyed, Jaden begins to work his way back to the Raven's Claw, only to discover even more reinforcement troopers blocking his path. Once reunited with Kyle back at the hangar bay, the two Jedi must defeat the Imperials Guard in the Raven's Claw before boarding the ship and escaping. The level ends with a cinematic showing the Raven's Claw fleeing yet another squad of TIE fighters as the Dreadnought explodes in the background, creating a fiery shockwave that envelops and destroys the pursuing Imperials. Again, I really love this level, and the design choice to pit Jaden against solely Imperial enemies with no disciples is excellent. At this point, the game is highly saturated with lightsaber duels, and while they are excellent, allowing Jaden to fight his way through the entire Dreadnought field with enemies who can't wield the Force is a great power trip, and allows us to not only see, but feel Jaden's progression in power as a Jedi Knight. The last mission of this segment of the game sees Jaden on his way to the Bright Jewel System to the planet of Ord Mantell in order to destroy a recently discovered stockpile of weapons which the Republic wishes to prevent from falling into enemy hands. I have to admit I honestly did not remember this level from playing the game in my youth, so imagine my shock and joy when the level begins and none other than Boba Fett arrives on his own mission to prevent Jaden from destroying the weapons. The gameplay of this level consists of avoiding Boba Fett and planting explosive charges on the weapon stockpiles. Boba Fett can be injured, causing him to temporarily fall back, however he cannot be fully defeated or killed. As one would expect from Boba Fett, he boosts around the level using his jetpack to pepper Jaden with blaster bolts from above. <laughs> If Jaden closes in on Fett and tries to engage him at close range, he will employ the use of his flamethrower, blasting Jaden with a powerful, fiery burst. Oddly enough, Boba Fett is armed with an Imperial E-11 blaster, which actually has the same primary and secondary fire modes as it does when used by Jaden. Occasionally, as Jaden works his way around the level seeking the weapon caches, Boba Fett will ambush him, landing nearby and firing one of his jetpack rockets. <laughs> With all the weapon caches destroyed, Jaden returns to his ship where he finds Boba Fett waiting and the Jedi and Bounty Hunter finally square off against one another. During the battle, Boba Fett uses essentially the same hit and run techniques he has throughout the mission, using his jetpack to boost high into the sky before blasting away at Jaden. Once Boba Fett is defeated, he casually states, no bounties on you, a shame, before fleeing the arena and ending the level. With the weapons destroyed and Fett defeated, Jaden reports back to Kyle who congratulates Jaden on facing down the deadly bounty hunter. In an excellent callback to Dark Forces, Kyle tells Jaden that he once battled the Mandalorian-clad warrior on Coruscant, barely making it out alive. Kyle states that he supposes that is something they both have in common now. With our five missions of the segment completed, Jaden reports back to the Jedi Academy, where Luke has assembled all of the Jedi. Luke tells him that the time has come to put an end to the Disciples of Ragnos, stating that he believes Tavion can be storing the Force power within the Scepter for only one reason, to resurrect Marco Ragnos. In order to prevent the return of the Ancient Sith, the Jedi must travel to Korriban and defeat Tavion and her forces. As the Jedi prepare to leave Yavin, however, Kyle tells Jaden that they are not going directly to Korriban, stating that he has received a distress signal from Rosh, claiming that he's being held captive on the Imperial-controlled planet of Tasper III. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. While Jaden questions the authenticity of the signal, believing it could be a trap, Kyle refuses to ignore the plea for help, stating that he's not willing to let Rosh die if the message is legitimate. Jaden agrees to aid Kyle on the rescue mission, and the two set out for Tasper III aboard the Raven's Claw. The two arrive on the rocky, crater-pocked planet a short time later, locating and landing on a desolate Imperial power facility. 
The Jedi immediately split up, with Kyle stating that he will make his way to the station's back entrance and that by splitting up they'll be sure to locate Rosh quickly. Jaden then makes his way into the facility, engaging Imperial forces in massive generator rooms and working his way from outpost to outpost across multiple bridges that span molten lava rivers on the planet's surface. Playing through this level again, I definitely feel like it may have helped shape the design for Mustafar in Revenge of the Sith, as we are battling our way through a massive industrial facility built over rivers of lava two years before that film was released. <laughs> The Power Facility is an extremely well-designed area and has one of the best mixes of Imperial and Disciple forces that the game has to offer. Unsurprisingly, at this late in the game, Jaden will be facing off against a little bit of everything when it comes to enemy variety. Imperial Stormtroopers pack the generator rooms, reinforced by officers and jetpack troopers, while Disciples of all classes guard the ramps, leading to higher and higher levels. Outside, the lava fields are patrolled by the ever-imposing hazard troopers, ready to blast Jaden away with their devastating concussion rifles. All of these elements combine into one of the most exciting and well-designed levels the game has to offer. One area I particularly enjoyed was a section of destroyed outdoor bridge over one of the lava rivers, which forced Jaden to platform through nearby buildings, defeating hazard troopers along the way. After fighting hordes of enemy forces, Jaden eventually faces off against a new type of disciple. These disciples resemble the two bulky warriors who aided Rosh in your battle with him on Vajun, with the difference being that these new opponents are now armed with lightsabers. Essentially, these warriors can perform any action Jaden can, from lightsaber attacks to force powers, and are an incredibly imposing foe. After defeating this frightening new enemy, Jaden finally makes his way to the interior of the power station's main facility. Upon entry, Jaden is immediately encountered by Allura, who taunts him, telling him that his mission to rescue Rosh is already lost, as Tavian has already turned the former Padawan to the dark side. Jaden tries to reason with Allura, telling her to join him and help him defeat Tavion, to which Allura simply laughs. Allura then states that she is going to find Rosh, and Jaden then begins to follow her tracks through the facility. One thing I really like about this level is that we can clearly see that this is the Disciple's base of operations, as it's adorned with huge stone bust of the ancient Sith Lord. On his pursuit of Allura, Jaden battles his way through hordes of Disciples in some great set-piece arenas, such as the interior of a massive furnace and coolant storage area both of these adding to the industrial atmosphere of the level. As we work our way through the level, we will occasionally see Allura at a distance who will mock Jaden before continuing deeper into the station. Jaden eventually finds himself on a series of conveyor belts processing blocks of metal ore. Jaden must carefully work his way through the factory's machines, avoiding being electrocuted, burned by steam vents, or crushed by the powerful mechanism used to form the ore. <laughs> Jaden eventually locates Rosh in a large cargo bay and angrily confronts the fallen Padawan. Rosh begs for mercy, stating that he was afraid and didn't tell him what to do after being captured. Jaden doesn't trust Rosh, though, and draws his lightsaber on his former ally, demanding to know how he could possibly trust him at this point. Kyle, on the other side of the facility, senses what is happening and reaches out to Jaden through the Force, urging him not to kill Rosh. Simultaneously, Allura appears on a catwalk above Jaden and Rosh, telling Jaden to give in to the dark side and strike Rosh down. Kyle begs Jaden to put his saber away while Rosh pleads for his life. And so we come to a fork in the road. Jaden can either choose the light side by putting away his lightsaber or the dark side by cutting Rosh down, changing the ending of the game. For this retrospective, I will cover both outcomes starting with the light side choice to spare Rosh. After choosing the light side, Allura attacks Jaden and their battle ensues. At the start of the duel, Rosh is immediately struck by Allura's lightsaber, cutting off his left arm and leaving the Padawan unable to aid Jaden. The duel against Allura, who wields dual red sabers, is fast-paced, exciting, and a great battle and challenge. After killing Allura, Kyle arrives on scene, grabbing up Rosh and saying that he must get him to a back to tank immediately. Kyle tells Jaden to head to Korriban with the other Jedi, and he will join them as soon as he can. Before Jaden leaves, Kyle tells him that he's proud of him for resisting the temptation of the dark side and sparing Rosh's life. And so Jaden travels to Korriban for the game's finale. As he comes out of hyperspace, we see that an Imperial Star Destroyer is in orbit and that the Disciples have already arrived on the ancient Sith world. Upon landing, Jaden is met by two other Jedi students. The students tell Jaden that the Jedi have spread out and are searching for Ragnos' tomb. He also tells Jaden that Master Skywalker is searching in a separate part of the valley. Before Jaden heads off to begin the search, the students warn him to be cautious as Disciples are waiting around every corner. After leaving the other students, Jaden immediately descends into one of the ancient nearby structures. Once inside, Jaden faces off against countless disciples who ambush him at every step. In order to proceed through the structure, Jaden must solve a variety of puzzles in order to open massive stone doors and work his way deeper and deeper into the tomb. 
Along the way, Jaden will be aided in battle by other Jedi students who will not only help Jaden but also follow him as he continues, making them an excellent resource in order to proceed more easily. We'll take him together. You're going slowly on the left. Take him now! No, Anakin, no! No! <laughs> After battling his way through massive catacombs and caverns against disciples of every type, Jaden eventually makes his way through the tomb and exits into a sprawling valley where disciples and Jedi are engaged in an all-out battle against one another. Across the valley, past an enormous pyramid, Jaden can see the tomb of Marco Ragnos, as it is adorned with a gigantic statue of the ancient Sith Lord. In order to reach the tomb, Jaden must make his way across the Devly Valley, engaging disciples and aiding Jedi students along the way. This really is how you correctly do a finale to a game with such a heavy focus on lightsaber combat as the valley is an all-out war zone between light and dark side users of the force and it's a blast to take part in the battle. Eventually, Jaden reaches the entrance of Marco Ragnos' tomb where he discovers three Imperial shuttles out front along with multiple squads of heavily armed stormtroopers. After defeating the troopers, Jaden enters the tomb and our final battle begins. Inside the tomb, Jaden faces off against a few more disciples before confronting Tavion herself in front of the statue-lined resting place of Marco Ragnos. As Jaden enters, Tavion is already blasting the tomb with the stored force energy of the scepter. Tavion tells Jaden that Ragnos will soon be reborn and the Sith will rule the galaxy once again. In reply, Jaden mocks Tavion, telling her he knows how she was defeated at the hands of Kyle and how she crawled away after being beaten. Tavion states that by killing Jaden, she will turn Kyle to the dark side and he too will join Ragnos. Jaden then ignites his sabers and attacks Tavion. During the battle, Tavion not only wields her lightsaber, but is able to attack Jaden using the scepter of Ragnos. Tavion can fire a beam of orange energy from the end of the scepter, as seen at the beginning of the game when she shot Jaden with it on Yavin. Additionally, Tavion can slam the butt of the scepter into the ground, releasing a purple burst of force energy and creating a shockwave that will throw Jaden back. Realizing that her defeat is imminent at the hands of Jaden, Tavion jumps to the top of Ragnos' tomb and drives the scepter into the rock itself, releasing the stored force energy and resurrecting the ancient Sith as a force ghost. After telling Jaden that he will kneel before him, Ragnos turns to Tavion, entering her body and possessing her. Tavion then discards her lightsaber. Instead, rearming herself with the staff. Grabbing the base of the staff, Tavion reveals that the staff shaft contains an ancient sword. Tavion draws the blade and attacks Jaden. As the battle begins, we can see that the sword is imbued with dark side energy as red lightning crackles around its blade. Tavion, now far more powerful, attacks Jaden using the sword in a variety of dark side force attacks, most notably force drain. The sword itself can also release an area of effect force drain attack, causing the blade's lightning to arc out in a large spherical area. After a prolonged battle, Jaden defeats Tavion, who falls and begins to crawl towards the scepter. Before Tavion can reach the scepter though, Jaden strikes the staff with his lightsaber, causing it to explode and killing Tavion. With Tavion dead, Ragnos' force ghost exits her body, threatening Jaden that he will someday return before being banished back into his tomb. We watch as Jaden exits the tomb, sealing it behind him by destroying the columns at the entrance, causing a cave-in. As Jaden walks back into the valley, he is met by Kyle and Luke, who ask him what happened, and after hearing what occurred, congratulate him on his success. Ever humble, Jaden states that he could not have done it without Kyle, who urged him away from the dark side. The level ends as three Republic Mon Calamari cruisers exit hyperspace and engage the Star Destroyer in orbit over Korriban. The Star Destroyer opens fire on the Republic vessels, but is no match for their superior firepower and is quickly destroyed in a fiery explosion. This is Admiral Redis of the Rebel Alliance. All squadron leaders report in. Admiral. We then cut back to the Jedi Academy where we see that Rosh has survived and in true Star Wars fashion has received a new cybernetic left arm. As Jaden watches Rosh test out his new arm, Kyle and Luke enter the room with Luke stating that the remainder of the Disciple of Ragnos forces have been defeated or captured. According to Luke, after the scepter was destroyed, the Disciples lost their ability to harness the force and were easily defeated. The game ends as Luke tells Jaden that his training is complete and he is now a true Jedi. Kyle states that there is still a galaxy full of trouble out there and asks if he's ready for his next mission, to which Jaden states that he is. So you might be asking what happens if Jaden doesn't follow the light and instead kills Rosh on Tasper 3, turning to the dark side. If this path is chosen, Jaden pursues Rosh through the cargo bay, eventually grabbing him as he places his saber to Rosh's stomach. Rosh begs for his life, telling Jaden that he was wrong about the dark side, to which Jaden responds, no, you were weak, before igniting the saber into Rosh. Allura congratulates Jaden on turning to the dark side and says to join her in the forces of Ragnos. Jaden tells her that he will not get rid of one master to replace him with another and that he will take the scepter and rule the galaxy himself. Jaden tells Allura that she is useless and he should have killed her on Hoth. And so their battle begins as Allura blasts Jaden with a burst of force lightning. You will be destroyed. <laughs> 
The Battle of the Laura plays out exactly as it did in the light side playthrough, with her using her dual sabers and a mix of dark side abilities to combat Jaden. Jaden again ends the duel by striking the Tweelik down unceremoniously before leaving the cargo bay. We then watch as Kyle arrives to the bay, just missing Jaden. Kyle goes to Rosh, who is badly injured and dying. Rosh apologizes, and Kyle tells him that he dies as a Jedi. Realizing Jaden's plan to take the scepter for himself, Kyle rushes off to Korriban to face him. Just as a side note, I don't usually use any mods or cheats on these retrospectives, as I'm trying to present the games as they were originally designed, but I made a slight exception here. You see, if you choose the dark side path, you are never given the option to change the saber blade to red for the final levels on Korriban, and honestly, playing as a dark Jedi just doesn't feel right without a red lightsaber. So you will see that for the Korriban finale, Jaden's sabers are red, but just know that the game does not allow for this option without cheats, which in my opinion is a greatly missed opportunity. And so Darkseid Jaden arrives on Korriban, landing and again encountering the two Jedi students. They welcome Jaden, but quickly realize that he has fallen to the dark side. The two try to detain Jaden, and our battle across Korriban begins. These levels play out fairly similarly to the light side playthrough, with the obvious exception being that now both Jedi and Disciples will attack Jaden on sight. To me, Jedi are far tougher enemies than the Disciples, due to the fact that they can employ force, heal, and protection just as Jaden can. Many battles can be avoided if the player so chooses, as the two factions are busy warring against one another, but just know that due to the vastly increased number of enemies Jaden now faces, some of which are able to heal themselves, this is a considerably more challenging section of the game. After making his way to Ragnos' tomb, Jaden confronts Tavion, demanding the scepter and telling her that he intends to kill her as Kai was too weak to do so. Tavion tells Jaden to join her and serve Ragnos, to which he replies that he will no longer serve anyone. The first tier of the battle plays out exactly the same as the light side campaign, with Tavion using a combination of saber strikes, blast from the scepter, and dark side force abilities to battle Jaden. Once defeated, however, Tavion tells Jaden that she will not beg for her life as she did with Kyle, and tells him to finish her, which Jaden does, striking her down with a vicious overhead blow. Jaden then moves to take the scepter from Tavion's corpse, but is interrupted by Kyle, who burst into the tomb. Kyle pleads with Jaden to resist the dark side, warning him that he knows the allure of the dark side is strong, but it will ultimately destroy him. Kyle says that he can't allow Jaden to do this, to which Jaden replies, then stop me master, and their battle begins. Kyle is by far the most challenging opponent of the entire game. Not only will he heal himself and use force protection, but he also possesses a variety of guard breaking grapple attacks that are as hilarious to watch as they are effective. They honestly seem like something out of a WWE game, not a Star Wars game. With Kyle pushing the attack and Jaden weakening, the fallen Jedi suddenly reaches out with the force, pulling the scepter to him and blasting Kyle with the weapon's powerful energy beam. Kyle is thrown to his back and Jaden then uses the scepter to shoot the ceiling above Kyle, causing it to collapse and burying Kyle under a pile of rubble. Jaden then uses the scepter to blast a hole into the side of the tomb and flee. Luke arrives on scene a short time later and helps Kyle from the rubble. Kyle tells Luke that Rosh is dead and Jaden has turned to the dark side. Luke states that he misjudged Jaden and Kyle remorses that he has lost most of his students. And with consequence. Luke states that he can still sense good in Jaden and encourages Kyle, telling him there is always hope. After agreeing that the scepter is too powerful of a weapon to exist, Kyle tells Luke that he's taking a leave of absence from the academy with the intention of hunting down Jaden and destroying the scepter. The Dark Side campaign ends as we see Jaden's Z95 headhunter enter the docking bay of the orbiting Star Destroyer. The Star Destroyer takes off into hyperspace, and we cut to Jaden standing on the bridge of the Destroyer, the ship's dead captain lying on the floor behind him. And so ends what is widely regarded as one of the best Star Wars games ever made, but should you play it in 2023? Honestly, this one is an easy yes. This is an excellent Star Wars game with great characters, a compelling story, excellent level design, an incredible variety of weapons, powers, and settings, and fantastic gameplay mechanics. The lightsaber combat alone is worth trying the game for, and that's not to mention the insane amount of gameplay approaches this game allows. I'm not even going to try to go over each individual weapon, force power, and saber style, and all of their possible combinations, as we would be here for another hour. Graphically, the game has aged well in my opinion, and the lightsaber blades specifically hold up very well. As stated earlier, the graphics are aided by excellent hitboxes and particle effects that add weight to saber strikes, blaster fire, and explosions. The music and sound is unsurprisingly excellent, as per usual with Star Wars games, and utilizes many of the classic and iconic John Williams tracks. The voice acting is good, with Kyle and Tavion being by far the best in my opinion. 
If you're wondering about multiplayer, it apparently still exists through a mod and as an active community, however I did not try it for myself. Overall, replaying this game was a blast, and while it was a daunting retrospective to complete, I had a fantastic time doing so. If you haven't played this game, whether you're a Star Wars fan or not, pick up a copy and check it out. I guarantee you will not be disappointed. So that is my complete retrospective of Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. What a fantastic game. What a fantastic Star Wars adventure. If you've made it this far in the video, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. If you're not a subscriber, please consider doing so. I just want to bring you guys more and more great Star Wars content. And hey, speaking of which, leave me a comment below. Let me know which game you want to see next in a retrospective. I'm going to keep doing these until we knock out every Star Wars game we can think of. Thanks for being here, guys, and I'll see you next time. We don't need that scum.